Hi everybody, it's Pastor Mark here at East Brady Baptist Church. So glad that you are joining us here for online worship for the week of July 17th, 2022. I'm just glad that you could join us. Let's start our worship today with our call to worship. To God's name be glory because of his love and faithfulness. The highest heavens belong to the Lord. It is not the dead who come to praise the Lord. It is we who extol the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I just want to remind you, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, we would certainly enjoy it and appreciate it if you use the comments uh, section to let us know that you were there. Just leave a brief comment. Let us know you joined us. Let us know how you're doing. And of course, prayer requests can be left there. We'll be sure as a church family to see those and to be praying for one another. That said, let's turn to our time of teaching today. I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. So if you've got an electronic device or a Bible uh, that you read, won't you open it uh, to Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, as we continue our series through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And as usual, we'll put the words of the scripture up on screen for you too. At Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor sh should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. You know, light is amazing. Do you ever think about how amazing light is? I mean, it's just like a fascinating concept even. Just one little sliver of light can light up an entire darkened cavern. I found that out oh, about a dozen or so years ago when my family was touring a series of underground caverns in West Virginia. It was like a touristy thing they did there, and we were touring them. And at one point in the tour, to prove just how completely dark it gets underground in those caves, the tour guide turns off all the lights. And, and you're supposed to just be awed just by how dark the darkness is. Like you can almost reach out and touch the darkness. And I understood that because, well, I had toured another set of caverns before when they had done the same thing. But on this particular tour, the effect was not as planned because, well, my little nephew Caleb must have been around five years old at the time. He had on a pair of those shoes that have the blinking lights in the sole, so when you walk along, your shoes blink. So when they turned off all the lights... Well, you could still see a little bit you could, because Caleb's shoes were just blinking and they were lighting the place up. That small blinking light filled up the whole place. Now, it wasn't a bright blinding light. You certainly couldn't read by that small amount of light, but you should, could still see around you. Even a light that small was enough to hold back the darkness. See, we were in a large cavern at that time, and I could have gone to the other side of that whole big large cavern... 
and I still would have seen that light on Caleb's shoes. It wouldn't ha have lit up anything else around it, but even at a distance, that tiny light would still cut through the darkness. You would see it blinking. And, you know, the tour guide at the time was kind of snooty about the whole thing happening because it had ruined her illustration. Imagine getting snooty with a five-year-old, right? But while it was not what she was going for, that experience did make a profound point to me. Any light, no matter how small, will destroy darkness because darkness cannot exist in the presence of light. One wonders then why there is so much darkness in our world. We don't disagree about that, do we? I mean, we all agree there's a lot of dark things happening out there in our world, right? A lot of darkness out there. Just to prove the point, here, here's just a smattering of headlines from, from Pittsburgh news websites from just one afternoon this past week. Are you ready? Disgraced attorney to be charged for the murder of his wife and son. U.S. kills ISIS group leader in drone strike in Syria. Iran set to deliver armed drones to Russia. Shelters, federal aid not enough to end homelessness in Allegheny County. Allegheny Councilman introduces abortion access legislation. Third case of monkeypox diagnosed in county. Surveillance video from Uvalde school shooting to be released. Local schools preparing to share new suicide hotline number with parents. And finally, man arrested for allegedly trying to break into two properties being high. See these headlines, they testify to the darkness in our world. These headlines alone have drugs, murder, mass murder, infanticide, suicide, war, plague, theft, poverty, all in just the lead news stories from one afternoon in our local area. That's darkness right there. And if you're like me, you look at all the darkness around us and it kind of leads you to wonder, where is all the light? If just a sliver of light can chase away the darkness, why so much darkness? Where's the light? Where is the light of God in this world? You know where God's light is? God's light is in you, and it's in me. It's in every person who claims salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The light of God is in his people. In our passage in Ephesians chapter 5 today, Paul writes that those who follow Jesus are now children of light. And he indicates that one of God's primary methods for bringing his light into this world's darkness is to shine it through us, his children of light. Look, in Ephesians 5 verse 8, Paul writes, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. See, Paul reminds us, hey, you were once part of all the darkness in the world. You were once purveyors of the dark. You were once part of that system that was just creating more and more darkness. But he pretty much says here, uh, not anymore. He tells us, now you are light in the Lord. The Lord, Christ, has brought you out of darkness to be his light. So he tells us now, live as children of light. Live so that the light of Christ shines in you. Live so that the light of Christ shines through you into the world, destroying the darkness that is there. You know why there is so much darkness in the world today? Because followers of Jesus are not living as children of light. We're not shining our light out there. We're too busy chasing after too many other things, making life about everything other than living in the light and, and for the light. And so the darkness, it just rains and we just let it because we're not like letting the light of Christ come through us. You want to see the darkness uh, in the world around you defeated? Then live as children of light. That's what Paul's saying here. And then he gives us another list, just another list to illustrate for us what it means to live as children of the light. These are things we don't do or stop doing and then there are things we do instead. And a lot of times, people look at lists like this in the Bible, and they make the mistake of thinking, oh, oh that's just, well, that's what Christianity, that's what church is just all about, just following a list of rules. Do this, do this, don't do that, so, so you can think you're a good person, so you can think you're better than everybody else. That's not why Paul gives us this list. That's not why he wants us to live this way. It's not just a, a legalistic recipe for being better than everybody else or for being good enough. 
Paul says, live like this so that the light of Christ in you by faith shines through you to defeat the darkness in the world. That's why we do these things. That's why we live this way. So what does Paul say we do and what we don't do to live as children of the light? Well, first this week, let's look at what we don't do. And then maybe, well, maybe we'll get to some of what we actually do do next week. But hey, what don't we do? Simply put, don't be impure. We do away with every form of impurity. Get rid of anything that makes us impure before God. That's what Paul's writing about in verse 3 when when he says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Paul writes that there must not even be a hint of any kind of impurity in us. It's just not proper for God's people, he says. God's holy people, you know, that he calls us holy. That means we are set apart for God's purpose and glory. We are made different for God's purpose and glory. See, we cannot be set apart. We can't be different for God if our lives are still the same as everyone around us, if we have all the same impurities going on in our lives still as everybody else in the world. So Paul says you, you need to be set aside for God to be holy. You need uh, to get rid of impurity. And, and when he wrote of impurities, the people of his day would have recognized right on the connection he was making to gold smelting or the smelting of other metals. You see, when gold is dug out of the ground, the actual gold is kind of intermixed with all sorts of other metals and materials as one big, ugly rock. Take a look at this picture. Uh, the inset there is a picture of gold ore. It's not shiny. It's not sparkly. It's not pretty. It's not gleaming uh, or anything like that. It's just ugly. Who would want that? Who wants to wear that in a ring around their finger? So what happens is gold is refined in the smelting process. The ore, uh, the rock, it's just heated up really, 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 really hot to the point where it melts. And because the gold is heavier than all the other stuff that it's in there with, the other stuff, the impure stuff called dross, it floats to the top or it rests on top of the heavier gold. So then they can just come and they can just scrape off the impure stuff or they can pour off the impure stuff so that what is left is the pure, shiny, valuable gold. See, the impurities were getting in the way of that gold sparkle, its luster, its shininess, its light. So they get rid of all the impurities so that the light can shine through. That's what Paul is telling his readers to do. Get rid of the impurities. Scrape away the nastiness in your life so God's light can shine through you. It's your holy purpose. See, when we have impurities in our lives, they actually block God's light from shining through us. And that way, they're kind of like clouds on what would otherwise be a sunny day. You know, it must have been about a month ago, I was out, and you guessed it, I was mowing on my tractor on a sunny evening. You know, it was evening, but hey, still plenty of time left before sundown. So I'm just mowing along, driving along my tractor, and I realized suddenly it had gotten really, really dim without me noticing in just like a period of like just like two minutes, right? Just these dark storm clouds, these heavy dark storm clouds, they had just kind of moved in, were all through the sky, all but blocking out the sun's light. You couldn't see the light coming through the clouds. So, so, hey, I knew, hey, this is bad. So I, I drew that tractor as fast as I could back to the shed, uh, put it away, I got things closed up, and ran down to my house. No sooner stepped foot on my back porch under the roof when the heavens just opened up in this fierce downpour. It was like uh, just a, a crazy series of events. But, but I knew I had to get in because darkness. You know why it was dark? Because those clouds had rolled in. The light couldn't get through the clouds, couldn't get through what was blocking it. Our impurities are like that. The light of Christ can't shine through. So it's like Paul is saying here, don't let the impurities in your life block God's light from shining through the darkness in this world. Get rid of the impurities. Scrape them out of your life so God's light shines through you into all the darkness. And so Paul gives us some guidance on just some of the impurities we need to get rid of. The list here is not exhaustive, but he does give us some things. He writes, there not, must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Oh, so much of the impurity in our life comes from sexual immorality. 
Now we could spend a lot of time and a lot of effort defining what sexual immorality really is and how the Bible defines that. In the society that is mostly failing at understanding godly sexual morality, perhaps that's even necessary at times. But to be concise for our purposes today, Sexual immorality is sexual relations or activity in any context other than between a husband and a wife. That includes relations if you are not married or even if you are not yet married. You say, oh, we're going to get married. Nope. That includes relations with someone else while you are married who isn't your spouse. That includes relations in the context that God has made clear are not holy, such as homosexuality and pedophilia. That briefly is what the understanding of sexual immorality would have been in the first century church. That's what Paul would have meant when he wrote uh, not even a hint of sexual immorality. So that's how we define it too. We don't change the definition to get around what Paul is teaching here. So he says here, there mustn't be a hint of it. There mustn't even be a hint of sexual immorality in your life. And you know why he says not even a hint? He says not even a hint because it can't be just a hint. Human sexual appetites, which God created for good purposes within the right context, they are so powerful that they don't stop at a hint, at just a taste. You open the door a crack to sexual immorality, and that sexual appetite, it's just going to barge the whole door down, right? Just bust through the whole place. Most of the time, when a follower of Jesus falls to sexual immorality, It's not just happening all of a sudden, all at once. It happens because at some point, he or she opened the door just to crack, allowed just the smallest hint. And little by little, it all poured in like a landslide until you're caught up in it. So Paul warns us not to mess with it at all, not even a hint of sexual immorality. He he goes on, in verse 3 to say, uh, you know, more impurity, not even a hint of greed. Greed is one of these impurities he speaks of. Now, let's talk about greed for a moment because it's just one of those sins I think that often, especially in the American church, just flies under the radar. Greed is holding on to and even hoarding excess when others do not have enough. Most people think greed is a sin that others need to be watched for and others have an issue with. It's a sin of the rich. And the Bible gives lots of warnings about what will happen to the rich if they are greedy and they don't share their uh, wealth to help the poor. So it's a rich people's sin. Here's the thing. When Jesus and other voices in the Bible address the rich, do you know who they're actually talking to? (laughs) They're talking to you and me right? We are the rich who are being warned against greed. Now, I know we look around us and we think, eh, I'm not rich. Neither are all these other people around me. We, we see people on TV or in the media. They're the rich people, right? No, oh, I'm not rich to American standards, but get this, just by virtue of being American, we are the richest people in the world right? Gautam Nair is an analyst who holds a PhD in political science from Yale University. And I want you to take a look at what he concluded after conducting research in 2018. He concluded, even the developed world's poor and middle classes are by global standards extraordinarily rich. After adjusting for cost of living differences, a typical American still earns an income that is 10 times the income received by the typical person in the world. Folks, we are rich. That's how God sees it. God doesn't see just America and define rich by that, but he sees the whole world. And, and, and the whole world's standard, we are the rich. We are the ones who are being warned about greed. And that's why, as a Bible teacher, it sometimes uh, leaves me heartbroken when I hear Christians around me saying, hey, we shouldn't be helping others who are poor, others in and from other places in the world, perhaps, because, hey, hey, that that means we're going to have to give up something. It's going to take something from me. Hey, everybody, not giving of your excess so that others will have just enough. Do you know what that's called? That's greed. See, we don't like talking about this in the American church very often because it just smacks us right in our spoiled, entitled American lifestyle. 
I have to tell you that most Christians in America have a greed problem. We are more concerned with clutching our luxuries, keeping our excess, than we are with letting God's light shine through us, living as children of the light. See, we can disagree about what and how collectively we as a nation should be doing to share our wealth and how much of it we should be sharing. We can disagree with that. But if you find yourself responding to that discussion, even inwardly by thinking or saying, hey, that's, that's going to take from me. There's not going to be as much for me. You need to be warned. You, as one of the world's rich, very well may be under the sway of greed. And you may be allowing its impurity to block Christ's light from coming into the world. So the darkness continues. You are the rich. You should be letting God's light shine into this world by sharing your wealth, your excess. And we all have excess. Paul says, get rid of every impurity. Not even a hint. And then he writes that that doing that means we get rid of vulgar talk. And so he goes on in verse 4. He writes, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. See, here's the thing. In chapter 4, we looked at Paul's teaching about putting off slander and unwholesome talk, right? Not, 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 not talking about other people because that hurts them. And then earlier in this sermon, we looked at his directive to do away with sexual immorality. So you got two sides of the spectrum, right? Obscene talk, foolish talk, coarse joking, they fit nicely on that spectrum between those two things, Right? They're part of each of those, right? So we're not going to belabor this point today, but I will say this, obscene joking and, and, and obscene talking are, are so common that we can begin to just accept them. We just do them and we don't even care, right? If you have allowed that to happen to you, if obscenity and crash jokes have snooped their, sneaked their way into your life, they're part of your lifestyle, you just go with them, you need to, again, be warned, Those things are probably keeping the light of Christ from shining through you into the darkness around you. Your witness for Christ is being obscured by them. And so the light of Christ does not shine into the darkness. You see, all these things we've been talking about today are impurities that Paul says keep us from living as children of light. In verse 3, he warns us not to let even a hint of them in our lives. And then he goes on in verse 5 to indicate that allowing these things to continue in our lives is like idolatry. We are putting those in our lives instead of God. These take the place of God as number one in our lives. And so in verse 11, he writes, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. He's very clear. Have nothing to do with them. Again, not even a hint. Rather, when they, when they happen, when they happen within the fellowship, within the church, expose them. Point out these attitudes and these things that are going on in love. In love, admonish people around you. Admonish yourself. That's important because in verse 6, Paul writes, let no one deceive you with empty words. See, sadly, there will be some within the church who desire to be disobedient to God in these things for their own reasons. They just want them to still be part of their lives. They don't want to submit their lives to God in these things. And so then they will try to convince you that these things aren't that bad. You should be for them. You should just go along with these things. They'll say sexual immorality. Well, it's not sexual immorality anymore. Times are different. Redefine that. Now, I remember talking about these things once someone said to me, oh, it's not like that anymore. It's the 90s. It was back in the 90s, but I still remember that. People say, oh, oh, times have changed. It's not a sin anymore. Or they'll say, it doesn't really hurt anybody if your conversation gets a little rowdy or, or off color, as long as everybody right there is okay with it. Or they'll say, oh, as long as everybody else around you has as much or more than you, you don't need to be concerned about greed or sharing your excess. Paul says those people are deceiving you. They're deceiving themselves and they're deceiving you and they will deceive you right into God's wrath. Paul tells us, you know better. Don't let them do it. Don't let them deceive you. It is a matter of your holiness before God and it is a matter of light 
and darkness in this world. Paul says, live as children of light. Don't let even a hint of impurity obscure God's light that he wants to come uh, and send through you. Not even a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a hint of greed. Not even a hint of vulgar speech. Be free of it, Paul says, so God's light can live in and shine through you. That this dark world would know God's light. You want to see darkness defeated? Let God's light shine through you. Not even a hint of impurity. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for giving us Jesus Christ, for making us pure when our sin had made us impure. God, as your children, uh, we sometimes struggle uh, to live as those pure people you have made us to be in Jesus. And so we kind of welcome impure things into us, God. But we recognize in, in this time that uh, when we allow those things in our lives, what we are doing is keeping your light from shining into this world. We are keeping your love from, from healing people. We are keeping your will from being done. So God, forgive us. Forgive us when we allow or we bring these impure things into our lives and into our hearts. God, I pray uh, for myself and for all who, who, who are listening or praying this with me. We pray uh, that you help us, you, you empower us, God, to live the life apart, holy for you. God, may we let not even a hint of sexual immorality or greed or obscenity in our lives, but let us fill up our lives instead with things for you. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, now is the point in the service where if you were at our in-person service, we would turn our attention to the collection of your tithes and our offerings. So we give you that opportunity here as well uh, to worship God through giving. And I just want to say, if you are not uh, regularly part of East Brady Baptist Church, you just kind of found us online today or you know, aren't with us regularly, we are not asking anything of you during this portion at all. Well, this is just an opportunity for those who are regularly part of our congregation to continue to, to, to worship God through giving to support our ministry here. And so if that's you, you can send your tithes and your offerings to us at East Brady Baptist Church, 508 Kelly's Way, East Brady, Pennsylvania, 16028. And we are blessed to always hear from you. Well, that's the end of our worship service today. We are going to conclude in a moment by singing the hymn, The Solid Rock. But first, won't you receive the blessing? May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.